Hello, welcome to the Master Anatomy platform. I am Dr. Akang from the Department of Anatomy, College of Medicine, University of Lagos. In today's lecture, we'll be talking about the brachial plexus. And you will learn about the components of the brachial plexus, the topography of the brachial plexus, the muscles inhibited by the nerves of the brachial plexus, and the clinical correlates. The brachial plexus is a plexus of nerves running from the ventral rami of C5 to T1 vertebrae. All right, so they run from the ventral rami of C5, spinal nerve, to T1. All right, they run from that the neck behind the clavicle into the upper limb, supplying some muscles in the neck some muscles of the trunk and all the muscles of the upper limb. This plexus is made up of five roots C5, C6, C7, C8, and T1. These five roots will merge to form three trunks the upper trunk, which is made of C5 and C6 roots, C7, which forms the middle trunk stands alone, and the lower trunk formed by C8 and T1. That's important. So, upper trunk, C5, C6, middle trunk, C7 standing alone, and lower trunk, which is also called the inferior trunk, that's C8 and T1. So, we have these trunks, these three trunks, dividing into two. Each of them divides into two. So we have six divisions from the three trunks. So divide into two anterior and posterior divisions each. All right, which will lead to the formation of three chords. As these divisions will merge and form three chords. So three trunks, six divisions back to three chords. But three chords are different from the three trunks. All right, they are lateral, the lateral chord, the medial chord, and the posterior chord. Now let me start by explaining that the posterior chord a unique chord because it has all the posterior components of these divisions help to form the posterior chord. So it takes from the posterior um, uh, division of the anterior of the upper trunk, the posterior division of the middle trunk, and the posterior division of the lower trunk. All right. While the medial chord again stands on its own, just like we had the middle trunk standing on, it just takes the anterior division, the anterior division of the of the um, of the lower trunk would help to form the medial chord, all right? The anterior division of the lower trunk, not the anterior division of the middle trunk, but the anterior division of the lower trunk. Why? Because the anterior division of the middle trunk and the anterior division of the upper trunk help form the lateral chord. It's important to note this uniqueness in the chords. So the roots are found around this, behind the scaling muscles. The trunks are found in the posterior triangle of the neck. The divisions are found behind the clavicle. And the curves are found in the axilla. Now, these divisions, these branches of, from the brachial plexus could be divided into two, depending on their um, the position uh, um, in relation with the clavicle. Okay, so if we, they are above the clavicle, they are called supraclavicular nerves. If they are below the clavicle, they are called infraclavicular nerves. So let's look at the infraclavicular nerves. And uh, from the lateral cord, the terminal branches of the lateral cord, we have the musculocutaneous nerve. The terminal branch of the medial cord, we have the ulnar nerve. The terminal branch of the posterior cord, we have the radial and axillary nerve. It's also important to note that the lateral and medial cords would would give um, branches that would that will help form another terminal nerve called the median nerve. This is a very important nerve too, among the infraclavicular nerves. So, the musculocutaneous nerve is a, the terminal branch of the lateral cord. We also have the lateral pectoral nerve and the lateral roots of the median nerve. The musculocutaneous nerve is the muscular component of this lateral continue this lateral cord all right which is the muscul muscular component of the terminal branch of the lateral cord the superficial components or the subcutaneous components 
the lateral continuous name of forearm. Of forearm. It's important you know that that's not mentioned here, but I'll talk about it later on. Okay. So this uh, muscular continuous nerve, the lateral pectoral nerve, and the lateral branch, lateral branch that uh, forms the. Medial. So we have here in the medial cord five branches, unlike the lateral cord that gave us, gave us three branches. Here we have five nerves formed here, and we have so we have the ulnar nerve. We also have the medial pectoral nerve. We also have the medial continuous nerve of arm. And the medial continuous nerve of forearm, then we have the medial roots that uh, medial root for the formation of the median nerve. Okay. And the posterior cord would give rise to five nerves: to the radial nerve, the axillary nerve, the tracheodosal nerve that forms that supplies the latissimus dorsi, the upper and the lower subscapula that will help to form the that would help to form the um, supply the subscapularis. We also have the supraclavicular nerves that help to, um, that are made up of the long thoracic nerve, which emanates from C5 to C7, which will supply the serratus anterior muscles, serratus anterior muscles. Uh, and a lesion to that nerve would cause winging of the scapula, okay, because sub the serratus anterior muscle helps to um, um, and keep the scapula uh, closely attached to the thorax, uh, especially the especially the medial side of the scapula. scapula. Right, the nerves to the subclavius also emanates from the supraclavicular nerves. We have it there, C5, C6. We also have the suprascapular nerve. We also have the dorsal scapular nerve, which supplies the rhomboids, the middle scalene, and Sometimes the levator scapulae. We also have its giving branch to the phrenic nerve, okay, the C5 branch, the phrenic nerve, and it also gives um, C5, C6 branch of, um, that supplies the longus coli muscles. All right. Now, the, the segmental part, the segmental continuous supply of the upper limb uh, can be divided this way, where we have C4 supplying the shoulder tip. C5 supplies the radial side of the upper arm, which is around the deltoid, the skin around the deltoid. We have the C6 supplying the radial side of the forearm, C7 supplying the skin of the hand, and the uh, C8 supplying the ulnar side of the forearm, T1 supplying the ulnar side of the upper arm, okay, and um, T2 supplying the skin of the axilla. So that's just what we talked about. You can see the distribution there. So now we are on the cause and distribution of the principal nerves. Okay, so we'll talk about the musculocutaneous nerve, the, red, the ulnar nerve, the radial, the median nerve, and also the axillary nerve. All right, so now in the musculocutaneous nerve, which arises from C5 to C7. All right. It's it's important you note that this is a nerve that supplies most of the muscles on the flexor compartment of the arm. All right. It supplies three muscles: the coracobrachialis, the biceps brachii, and the brachialis. All right. So it it rises just below the pectoralis minor muscle and uh, pierces the coracobrachialis, supplying it and the a biceps brachii, a biceps um, brachialis. Afterwards, it moves to the lateral compartment of the arm uh, and descends into the forearm as a lateral continuous nerve of forearm. Lateral continuous nerve of forearm. So, um, the muscular continuous nerve is said to be the muscular or the motor muscular um, nerve or the motor nerve for the arm, um, flexor compartment of the arm, while the uh, continuous nerve is the lateral continuous nerve arm. So now the ulnar nerve, which is the nerve from the median cord, all right? So it runs from the medial side of the brachial artery and it will supply no muscle in the arm, but supplies the 
one and a half muzzle in the flexor compartment of the forearm. Just one and a half muzzle. So it supplies flexor capi ulnaris and the medial side of the flexor deuterium profundus. Okay, so it runs on the medial side of the um, brachial artery and um, it, it, run, it runs downwards distally as it pierces the intermuscular septum and lies between the septum and the medial head of the triceps. It leaves the arm posterior to the medial epicondyle of the humerus. At that point, it actually causes a funny sensation. That's why that bone at that point is called the funny bone, all right? Where it now enters into the flexor, uh, common flexor origin, supplying the flexor ulnaris, uh, flexor capi ulnaris, and the medial half of the flexor deuterium profundus. The radial nerve is a long nerve. It's actually the major nerve of the posterior cord because it receives from C5 to T1. It supplies all the extensor compartment of the arm and extensor muscles of the forearm, all right? So it supplies all of them and the extensor in, even uh, to the extensor compartment of the forearm, which will run into the, into the hand, all right? So it supplies and supplies the sensation on the on the dosum of the of the hand. All right. So it runs behind the brachial artery. It will take a spiral, um, a spin around the humerus. Okay. So in between the medial head of um, tricep and the and the long head of triceps. Okay. So it runs and spirals to the lateral compartment, pierces the lateral intermuscular septum. And lies between the brachioradialis and the uh, um, and the brachialis, all right. And in, so from there it enters into the cubital fossa, divides into two again: the superficial component and the deep component, which is the um, posterior interosseous nerve. Okay. So that's how it moves and innervates the rest of the extensor muscles of the forearm, and um, that's that about radial nerve. The median nerve is a major nerve. In the forearm, it supplies no nerve in the arm. It supplies no muscle in the arm. All right, it's it rises from C6 to T1, okay, and it rises lateral to the brachial like, brachial artery. The ulnar nerve runs medial to the brachial artery, while the median nerve runs lateral to the brachial artery. Okay, so it's you you realize that it's it runs that way and it's from the from the, it crosses the medial side to the um, um, to the brachialis and runs into the cubital fossa deep in the cubital deep to the bicipital aponeurosis and the median cubital vein. Okay, it supplies all the flexor muscles of the forearm except except the flexor capi ulnaris and the medial side of the flexor deuterium profundus. The axillary nerve is a nerve that ends in the, around the deltoid, around the deltoid muscle of the shoulder. So it supplies the the deltoid, supplies the deltoid and the teres minor. Okay, like the deltoid and teres minor. Okay. So that leads us into our clinical correlates, and one of the most important clinical correlates when it comes to the brachial plexus is the Epps palsy. That is traction to the upper trunk, all right? Traction or damage to the upper trunk, C5, C6. You, it, it will present as what we call waiter stick, where you have the, the arm line adducted, you have the forearm pronated, and the, the wrist face, the, the, the the fingers, the fingers facing backwards, all right? So like a waiter or a, um, uh, some security men trying to get a tip, okay? Or some something like that, all right? So that's how it presents itself. So we call that Epps palsy, lesion or damage to the upper trunk. Don't forget that. So we also have cases where you have damage to the lower trunk, lower trunk. So we talked about upper trunk, now we're talking about lower trunk. And the lower trunk damage is called Clump case paralysis. Clump case paralysis. Where it also presents with Horner syndrome because of, of 
um, the cervical sympathetic chain that some most times is also damaged. All right. Now this could occur where you have um, um, a hyper extension of the arm, or where you have like um, during childbirth where the pull of the arm or the the, the upper limb, the pull is so much that it could affect the 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 trunk, the lower trunk. All right. So, but while in Epps palsy, remember in Epps palsy, I think I forgot to say this, that that occurs because of the extension of the angle between the head and the neck, as in a fall on the shoulder, increasing that angle. Or sometimes you in childbirth too, when the um, the child happens to have a broad shoulder, or let's see the the um, the uh, pelvic the pe pelvic outlet is smaller, and um, the child's uh, shoulder is a bit broader. So. It causes it care is not taken. It could be an a hyper extension of the angle between the head and the neck at that point, causing a traction on the breaker plate or the upper trunk, and that could result in Epps palsy. Okay, so that's the difference between Epps palsy and the some case paralysis. Okay, another another common another common compression of the of the cords or the um, the brachial plexus would occur after parties, after parties where um, most times uh, drunks experience this a lot, you know, after they, because they are tipsy, they come back, they are tired and all that, and they rest on a chair. When they rest on that chair and they put their arms over the chair and they rest their armpits there, and that compression on the armpits could result in what we call crotch paralysis or what they call Saturday night palsy. Uh, those who also use crutches could also experience this compression and this will result in what they call the a wrist drop because there's a damage on the radial nerve. Anytime there's damage on the radial nerve, remember that the radial nerve supplies all the muscles of the forearm, extensive compartment of the forearm and which helps to extend the wrist. Uh, okay, so when there's a problem there, we have wrist drop because there's no opposition to those muscles. All right. Now we could also have what they call claw hand. I've talked a bit about it in clone case paralysis, claw hand. All right. Now, but here, I will try to talk about the damage to the ulnar nerve, where if the ulnar nerve is damaged at the wrists, at the wrists, at this point where there's lacerations, maybe due to surgery or something, the lacerations, and you damage the ulnar nerve at this point, you realize that some of the muscles supplied by the ulnar nerve, which I talked about, the flexor carpi ulnaris, and the the middle compartment of the flexor digitorum profundus will not be affected. However, all the intrinsic muscles here would be affected. All the intrinsic muscles in the hand will be affected except the lateral two lumbricals. Lateral two lumbricals. Those ones will be spared because those ones are supplied by the median nerve. All right, so. Adduction and abduction will be lost here, but gripping, gripping, gripping will still be very possible because the flexor muscles are all working. All right, so the adduction, abduction will be lost, intrinsic muscles will be lost, and the adductor policies would not also work. Okay, so we could also have damage of this ulnar nerve at the elbow, at the medial epicondyle. And when that happens, of course, with the flexor, the uterine profundus, the medial compartment, and the flexor carpi ulnaris will be lost. Uh, once there's paralysis to those ones, gripping becomes, you know, you, you could still make a grip, but it can't be a hard grip anymore. Uh, okay, and essentially lost to the ulnar one and a half, one and a half uh, fingers. When there's damage to the median nerve at the wrists, you, the lateral three and a half fingers will be paralyzed. There will be no movement there. So all the thinner muscles will be paralyzed except the adductor policies that is innervated by the ulnar nerve. All right? So if this damage to the median nerve occurs at the elbow, you realize that all the pronation of the forearm is lost because extensor muscles of the forearm are not working. The pronation of the forearm is lost. You also realize that the um, the wrist 
So the wrist flexion is lost. So we have a wrist drop. Then you also have ulnar nerve deviation, ulnar side deviation. So it, the, the hand deviates to the ulnar side. All right. And the major things that occur in the median nerve spasm. Another situation could occur where you we call we, we call it hyperextension syndrome. And many times this occurs when there is a hyperextension of the arm, especially in the case of painting a ceiling. When you paint the ceiling for a long time, you could have that because of the hyperextension of the of the arm, causing a lot of causing numbness, compression on the cords there, so it could lead to numbness, paresthesia, erythema, and also weakness of the hand. Once the paralysis, once the compression on the axillary arteries for a long time, it could lead to ischemia, and um, once that compression also occurs on the veins, you realize that there is dilation of the superficial vein. Another common, another not very common, it's it's called the prefix brachial plexus, where you have the brachial plexus arising, originating from C4 to C8, that's just a bit earlier than the normal. So C4 to C8. It still has five roots, but this time around is C4 to C8, as against C5 to C1. Right. So that scenario is called prefix brachial plexus. And just as we have prefix brachial plexus, we could also have the post fixed breakup plexus. This occurs later. So instead of occurring from C5 to T1, it occurs from C6 to T2. Now, this one is susceptible to compression by the first rib because of its proximity to the first rib. Right? It's easily compressed. In some cases, about 0.5% of persons could have cervical rib. And when they have cervical rib, they could have um, compression on the lower trunk because cervical rib means that there's a rib on the seventh cervical vertebra, a short rib. This could compress the lower trunk, resulting again in you know compression of the ulnar nerve and everything that has to that has roots that share C8 and T1. Alright. So even the radial nerve, some part of it will be compressed, and the, the median nerve, some part of it will be compressed. So that's what happens here, All right? Then we could also have backpacker's palsy, or what is called rucksack palsy. Now, this occurs because of the carriage of a heavy bag on the back. This, that bag is strapped around the shoulder. So this strap here could compress the trunk and the divisions here, leading to um, um, numbness on the upper limb. All right. So, I'll say, well done. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the lecture. If you did, please do like our channel on YouTube. Look at, check out other lectures on the Master Anatomy platform. Again, there are quizzes that you could take and, um, and see how you understood the lecture. Test yourself. There are free quizzes there, right? You could test yourself and see how well you understood the lecture. If you have any questions, you could message us on the Master Anatomy platform. You'll get a response which will explain the lecture better for you. And if you also need a private tutor, let us know. Thank you so much. Have a nice time.